Hello everyone and thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Today I'm going to be offering another entry in my series on the SKS pattern carbine, this time addressing the oh so divisive question, how do the different platforms compare to each other in terms of quality? In this specific installment, I will be talking exclusively about Soviet examples. Before diving in, however, it does feel prudent to acknowledge that it's been my experience that a small but vocal subsection of the American firearm owning public seems to struggle tremendously when confronted with opinions different than their own. Well, I'm rather certain that based on the content of this video, I'm going to be encountering that regardless of what I say or do, perhaps I can mitigate just a little bit of it by reminding viewers of something which I hope is obvious, which is that everything in this video is my opinion, nothing more. I am not the ultimate arbiter of truth regarding SKS pattern carbines, nor is it my intention to present myself as such. What I am, I think, is someone with a disproportionately high level of experience with this particular platform and with a professional military background in small arms repair, which despite not directly involving the SKS in any way, does lend itself well to interpreting my experiences into meaningful and hopefully accurate conclusions. Additionally, I've been fortunate enough to maintain a fairly strong reference collection of SKS pattern carbines for the better part of a decade now, and I have a lot of trigger time using a lot of different types of ammunition on a lot of different examples of each variant I'm going to be discussing in this series. For those who haven't seen my SKS identification video, which should be linked in the description, those variants include Soviet, Romanian, Albanian, Yugoslavian, Chinese, and sub-variants thereof. All that said, again, I strongly encourage viewers to take my perspective for what it is, one man's opinion, and weigh it critically alongside whatever other sources of information you're drawing from. If ultimately you disagree with some or all of what I have to say, that's okay. My goal is not to live in an echo chamber, but simply to honestly report what I have experienced in the real world with these awesome carbines, especially when it contradicts the conventional wisdom that was passed on to me by others. So with all that out of the way, let's return to the question which is how do the different SKS pattern carbines compare to one another in terms of quality? Well, I think there's two valid answers to this question. A practical answer, which will take about 75 seconds, and a pedantic answer, which will take however much longer is remaining in this video, plus however many additional parts of this video I've created, minus the next 75 seconds. So let's knock out the practical answer first. All SKS pattern carbines are more or less the same, and when left in factory configuration with matching parts, it's almost unheard of to find one that doesn't reliably function as designed. All rifle barrels are consumable parts and subject to inevitable degradation with use, but the non-chrome-lined barrels found on Yugoslavian and early Tula production examples are much more likely than other examples to exhibit accuracy inhibiting corrosion and erosion. Provided, however, that such conditions are not present, any SKS pattern barrel, regardless of origin, should be capable of combat effective accuracy within the limitations of the 7.62 by 39 millimeter cartridge and the intended role of the carbine itself. There are measurable discrepancies in the performance, materials, and construction types of different patterns. However, these discrepancies are overwhelmingly negligible in terms of practical significance. As a general rule of thumb, anyone who insists on a well-defined hierarchy among SKS pattern carbines based on the premise of critical advantages or deficiencies in one model versus another is almost certainly regurgitating baseless and decades-old lore or drawing conclusions from a small and non-representative sample size rather than speaking from direct experience with a wide sample size. In summary, rifle is fine. And if that's all you needed to know, feel free to ignore the rest of whatever is coming in this series and go outside and enjoy your rifle. Still here? Awesome. Sounds like you, like me, simply aren't willing to leave well enough alone and want the deeper pedantic scoop. Great. So for part one, we're talking about the Soviet SKS-45, and we're going to dive right into what is probably the most controversial perspective I have to offer on relative quality, and that is that I think the quality of SKS-45s relative to non-Soviet examples is overrated. Now let's be clear, I'm not saying Soviet SKS 45s are bad or poorly made, not at all. I think they have a lot going for them, which I will elaborate on shortly. What I am saying is that I strongly disagree with the often repeated claim that they're the best. As the original, and as a very well-made rifle to be sure, I will happily agree they are the base standard by which all other examples must be judged but they are not, in my opinion, the gold standard. So first, what do they have going for them? Well, above all else, I would say is consistency and quality of manufacture. 
in my general experience, if you've gotten into the guts of one SKS-45, you've gotten into the guts of all SKS-45s, intentional technical variations notwithstanding. The Soviets seem to keep very tightly within the allowed tolerances of manufacture, and aside from subtle variances in sear engagement, in which tiny dimensional differences can result in a substantial difference in felt trigger press, Soviet components overwhelmingly seem to fit and interact with each other in more or less the same way. Additionally, the machining of components is typically very clean and professional, and the quality of materials is excellent. On a fully matching example, the cycling and reliability of Soviet carbines is legendary, and even totally mismatched guns usually function flawlessly as well, with the most sensitive component seeming to be the magazine. All of this points towards high quality manufacture, and I think that's exactly what it is. So why then am I unwilling to admit the ultimate preeminence of Soviet carbines? Well, there's no delicate way to say it, but I've very consistently found that in the presence of equally excellent bores, the Soviet carbines are the least mechanically accurate of all SKS pattern carbines. Across many examples and using many types of ammunition, I have found that Soviet SKS 45s typically shoot around three to five MOA. Definitely good enough for government work, definitely good enough to rearrange priorities at 300 meters, but not quite as good as the average production example from certain other countries, specifically Yugoslavia and China. Let me be clear that I am a mechanic and not a sniper, but all the same, I am a good enough rifle marksman to know when group distribution is on me and when it is on my weapon. And in the case of the SKS-45, the weapon regularly reveals to me the boundaries of its accuracy potential. So why would that be? Well, I've got a couple of working theories, including bore lining and barrel interface specifically. However, however, at this time, I can't be positive. So I will try to refrain from speculation. And instead, let me offer a couple of potentially relevant tangents. When talking about Soviet SKS 45s, I think it's crucial to remember that Soviet production was relatively brief and took place in the 1950s, at least a decade before the bulk of international SKS pattern carbine production, and several decades before the end of international SKS pattern carbine production. The USSR in the 1950s had a phenomenal pool of cheap, skilled labor, one of the benefits of communism, if you can call it that, and outstanding old world machining techniques, but simply lacked access to some of the more modern production techniques utilized by, again, Yugoslavia and China. I think a relevant comparison can be made with pre and post 1964 Winchester rifles. While most Winchester collectors understandably prefer the old world craftsmanship and glassy smooth actions of a pre-64 Winchester, almost everyone at this point begrudgingly admits that the later models, despite their cost cutting construction, actually exhibited measurable increases in accuracy, all else being equal. I suspect that at approximately the same time, a comparable process occurred in the production of SKS pattern carbines and yielded a similar result. Additionally, it may be prudent to point out the obvious, which is that Soviets did not have one critical benefit which was afforded to every other SKS pattern carbine producer, which is the wisdom of experience. The Soviets had to start from scratch and through good old fashioned research and development, refine a technical data package from the ground up. As it turns out, by the time they had everything squared away, they no longer had a military use for the rifle they had spent all this time and money developing, and they gave it away, or licensed it, to Comblock allies. Countries like China and Yugoslavia got to pick up right where the Soviets left off, and with significantly less total investment of time and money, were still able to develop distinct improvements to the design. This phenomenon in small arms development is not unique, and to borrow another American example, I would encourage viewers to think of the Italian BM-59. Could the Italians have developed a first-generation autoloading battle rifle in the 1930s as good as the M1 Garand? Not a chance. They tried and they failed. But once we handed them 20 years of R&D for a rifle we knew we weren't going to be using for much longer, they were more than capable of taking that already polished product and adding a couple features to make it that much better. I believe the same general principle applies to later production SKS pattern carbines, albeit on a slightly less dramatic scale. So with all that out of the way, let me backtrack for a moment and again emphasize that I really don't think that this relatively small discrepancy in accuracy actually mattered from a combat application, which is the intended use of an SKS pattern carbine. It might be interesting to others 
like myself who shoot the SKS in a civilian oriented manner, shooting static paper targets from supported positions, they may notice what I've noticed, which is a measurable discrepancy in accuracy, and they may choose, like I've chosen, to leave their Soviet examples at home on range days. That being said again, that probably didn't translate at all to the intended use, which was military. Accuracy isn't the only thing we need to talk about, however, regarding the Soviet examples. The other issue I have with many Soviet SKS-45s is the presence of arsenal refurbishment, specifically the application of high temperature black paint. While this does serve as an effective metal preservative, it also adds substantial friction to small moving components, and while this doesn't impede weapon function, it can impede overall usability. Obviously this doesn't apply to non-refurbished examples, and there's not necessarily a shortage of those in the US and Canada, but the average Joe Schmo with the Soviet SKS is likely going to be encountering this high temperature paint. Quick demonstration of how that high temp paint applied during the refurb process negatively affects the controls. Below we've got non-refurb, very positive safety. It, you can kind of get it balanced right in the middle, but it's going to want to just go home into one of the two positions. This thing will just hang out anywhere. The friction is enough to overcome it in every single position. If you want to move it, you got to move it all the way. And if you stop, it's going to get stuck. Pretty annoying. Again, look how nice this is by comparison. So what's the lesson here? Well, I think that sometimes people confuse quality of manufacture with quality of performance. And to me, both are equally relevant contributors to overall quality of a system. Soviet SKS 45s are undoubtedly of high quality manufacture and consequently are particularly appealing to curio and relic minded individuals like myself who find something deeply charming about the inimitable character of old world firearm construction. That said, old world construction has always had pros and cons, and one of the cons seems to be a failure to fully exploit accuracy potential, not just in the SKS pattern, but on other platforms the world over. Additionally, the beauty and slick interface of precision machine parts gets just a little bit less cool when you slather it in barbecue paint. So for those reasons, I rest my case that while the Soviet SKS-45 is undoubtedly a well-made rifle and an indispensable piece in the reference collection of any self-respecting SKS pattern carbine enthusiast, to simply claim that it is the gold standard of SKS pattern carbines doesn't tell the full story. All right, so that's where I'm going to cut the video for today. Um, if I haven't burned my bridges with you yet and you are interested in hearing my thoughts on the relative quality of the other SKS uh, patterns, which I promised to deliver, those are going to be the uh, Romanian Albanian, I'm probably going to lump those into a single video, and the Chinese and Yugoslavian, uh, hint, hint, wink, wink, I think that's going to be the most interesting video in this series. Uh, those will be linked in the description just as soon as I get them out. I do have additional content on my channel. If you like what I'm doing, um, I do have other firearm and military history related content you may find interesting. Um, I know that I'm not for everybody, but I have been getting some support from some people and I do really appreciate that. Um, and I do uh, hope to catch you in future videos. Thanks again. Um, have a great day.